Um, so this is me um, many years ago. Uh, I, I was <laughs> I was born in Asia and, and uh, a father who was an English teacher. So the youngest of six children was dragged around the world uh, until I moved to the UK as a teenager uh, and studied medicine at University College. I better come this side. I think sorry. Is that better? Um, University College. Uh, then spent a year in Melbourne, a year in UCSF, and a, a PhD in Oxford. And then having trained as a neurologist, um, for some reason, uh, decided to go for two or three years to Vietnam in 1995 and stayed for 18 uh, years, moving back to the UK uh, about 15, 16 months ago to be uh, head of the Wellcome Trust. And this is the hospital I was based in Ho Chi Minh City. It's a government hospital. Uh, I think I'm right in saying it's the largest infectious disease hospital in the world, somewhere between 600 and 1,000 beds. Uh, it, it, it can grow or, or uh, it can expand or, or contract depending on the, the need. And this is just some of the people, I won't go into all the names, just, just highlight Professor Heian, who was really a great mentor in my whole time uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and some of you in the audience would remember Professor Heian, although he looks slightly older now. And then for some reason, I, again, I gave up my idyllic life in Vietnam. This is, this is actually Hue in central Vietnam and uh, transferred to a, a beautiful commute every morning. In fact, for the last two years, I, I was uh, spending four days a week working in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, and spending one day a week working in Singapore, commuting between those two. And I can promise you, although that sounds ridiculous, that daily commute from Oxford to London every day, uh, I know which one I'd prefer to do on a regular basis. So this, I'm very much at the clinical end of everything we've discussed today. So, so uh, up until, September of 2013, I, I was a, clinic, a clinician working in the government hospital in Vietnam, and, and this was essentially my daily uh, ward round, and that would be typical from anybody here who is from various parts of the world. This would be an absolutely typical ward round that I should think uh, would go on anywhere. I had a particular interest having trained in neurology, in neurological infections, uh, but, but you, you deal with whatever uh, comes your way. And the world is changing, and I think today's discussion and tomorrow's discussion has to be, take into account that the world is going through a period of tremendous change. David used to look like this, and increasingly looks like that, and that's not just true in London or, or, or Washington or Dublin. It's also true in Ho Chi Minh City, it's true in Jakarta, it's true in Delhi, uh, it's true in Karachi, uh, it's true everywhere. And that has a profound uh, implication for infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases. And it has a profound implication for the way health services are organized. In the so-called Western developed world, on the whole, and there are obvious huge exceptions to this, but on the whole, health systems were, did, not have to, did not have to contend with both acute infectious diseases and chronic diseases. That is not true in most of the rest of the world, where now people are having to contend with the double whammy of acute infectious diseases, which demands a certain style of health service, and chronic, chronic non-communicable diseases and chronic diseases. And the health systems that one needs to deal with both of those are actually very, very different. And so the, the many parts of the world, 70, 80% of the world's population, is living in countries whose health systems are not really set up for the sorts of challenges uh, we're likely to face in the 21st century. And also on top of that, in, in the rise of the non-communicable diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, oncology, the coming of intensive care beds, etc., the much larger uh, uh, basic uh, BMI of most people, you're also dealing with the coming of drug resistance. And, and I think drug resistance and emerging infections, we're talking about Ebola at the moment, but we have to consider those two uh, in, the say, in the round and in the context of the health systems uh, that they're occurring in. And the coming of antimicrobial resistance will have an impact not just on infectious diseases, but on the whole of modern medicine. It would be impossible to give oncology or to have a patient in intensive care. Uh, or uh, the great, I grew up in the era before antiretroviral drugs, and I was a junior doctor before we had access to them. The thought of untreatable HIV is just so uh, appalling that we cannot, cannot let that happen. But I fear that unless we uh, change the way we're working, we change the way we're doing research, that that is uh, going to come to us in the working lives of people in this room.
On top of those acute, endemic, and non-communicable diseases, we also have the coming of emerging infectious diseases, and they're driven by many, many factors. And I think one of the take-home messages from today and tomorrow has to be that we need to consider and we need to train the next generation of, in, uh, of scientists, researchers, ethicists in a much broader context than we have in the past. The siloing of various elements, the siloing of infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases, the siloing of ethics outside the boundaries of clinical medicine or public health, uh, uh, animal diseases, uh, ecology, uh, environmental factors, uh, humanitarian responses, this is Kathmandu where I've also done a lot of work in the last decade, will all play uh, their roles. And the rise of the emerging infections are not are not uniform across the world. There are various hotspots. This is an old paper now, but, but it, it highlighted a long time ago, and I think it's still relevant, although it has been updated a lot now. If you're yellow or red on this, these graphs, this is zoonotic pathogens from wildlife, zoonotic pathogens from non-wildlife, that's uh, domesticated uh, poultry, etc., uh, vector-borne diseases, and of course, vector-borne diseases, very prone to environmental and climate change. And for the first time, really, the coming of drug resistance in the context of emerging infections. But what needs to happen on top of this overlay is something that we touched on today but didn't really discuss in sufficient detail, and that is we need to see the ecology and the emergence of infections on the, on the backbone of the vulnerability, resilience, and fragility of the health systems that underpin it. And the governance, not only health systems, but the whole governance of those countries that we're talking about. What may emerge for instance, here in Guangzhou in southern China, because of a, of a completely different healthcare system, may not have the same impacts as what may uh, 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 occur here in Lagos. We cannot just see the ecology, the environment, the, the human, the animal, uh, or any of these factors in the absence of understanding the economics, the governance, uh, the health systems that, that uh, feature. Sorry, this is uh, repeating on me, sorry. So these drivers of what I think is a new global health, uh, and we need to think of it in a different way than we felt it, dealt with it in before. We've generally thought about it in terms of tropical diseases in 1995, that's how I came into the, into the area. But I think in, even in that 20 year period, the world has changed. We have an amazing amount of travel, and the fastest growing travel globally at the moment, albeit from a, a low base, I'm not saying it's the biggest trade and travel globally, but in terms of its trajectory, it's this travel. It's Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa. The increase in travel, the increase in trade, the increase in movement of both people and ships and trade and, and all that goes with that is huge in this corridor in a way that we have not seen before in history. And that will have profound implications. Uh, we have the conflicts that we all know about in various parts of the world, uh, which are also an underpinning. The mistrust that the trust, which is a word that's come up time and time again today, and it will do tomorrow, and I think actually underpins much of what we talk about, the trust between the governed and the governing, between the community and the, uh, uh, and the, the medical professions broadly defined, uh, between the mouse and the guy that pooed in the forest. The trust that exists across these is absolutely critical, and where trust breaks down, the ability that it takes years to reform it, and it can be lost in an instance, the environmental change that drives the movement of mosquitoes or vector-borne diseases, or where bats live today and where bats may live tomorrow, given that bats are a major conduit of many emerging diseases. Drug resistance is crucial, and this is one of the major contributors to that, and that's counterfeit medicines. The rise of counterfeit medicines, some of which have zero content, some of which have 10%, some of which have 50%, and it may be that those marginal percentages are actually a major driver. And then finally, I think one of the key, key drivers has been the movement to urbanized living. And the difference in the way societies work, the way societies interact with each other, both at an individual, a family, and a, and a community level, is a major driver. Uh, and if we don't understand the anthropology and the social science behind that changing world, I don't think we'll be able to put in place either the health systems to deal with endemic, infections and non-communicable diseases, but also have the resilience in the systems that can then deal with the emerging crisis. And although we talk about these things in, uh, in, in major events, we all remember going back to SARS, we remember the pandemic of 2009. What we don't remember, 
is that in various parts of the world, there are actually epidemics of one type or another going on on an almost daily basis that disrupt health systems, that disrupt the ability of people to trust the healthcare that they're delivering. And that has secondary knock-on consequences for their willingness to accept when you're in the middle of a, uh, let's say you're in the middle of a hepatitis E outbreak, uh, what you'll do in terms of looking for care for malaria or for TB or for maternal care. So none of these things exist in isolation. People do not say, oh, I've got hepatitis E, therefore, and, and get bad treatment for that, and therefore I'll trust the rest of the healthcare system. These have knock-on effects through the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, system. The speed of which these happen is really frightening. And, and for one reason or another, I've been involved in, in very personally involved uh, in terms of patient care with many of the epidemics of the last decade. And one of the remarkable things, going back to 1918, these are weeks of the year in 1918, this is September, October, November, December, in four cities, New York, London, Berlin, and Paris. And you can see the upswing in mortality in a single geographical location, and the downswing and the background to normal. And of course, there are subsequent waves of the influenza epidemic. This is Mexico in 2009, where some people in this room, and, and I was in, in uh, April of 2009, and in one center, again, about six weeks, uh, in the first outbreak when your ability to learn real lessons are at their, at their most important because they'll have knock-on consequences. Actually, it was also true in Jon Snow's time uh, in, the, in the cholera outbreaks in London. And I'll come back to that. Six weeks is a very important figure to remember, 42 days. So these are just some of the, I've personally been involved in Nipah in Malaysia and still ongoing in Bangladesh today. Uh, SARS, of course, everyone remembers, bird flu. Uh, massive outbreaks of enterovirus. Uh, it hit the newspapers recently because there was an outbreak of enterovirus 68 in the United States. But actually, over the last five years, 10 years, there's been massive outbreaks of enterovirus across Asia, which has had huge knock-on consequences for health systems that almost nobody talks about. Hemolytic uremic syndrome in one of the most advanced countries on Earth, in Germany, led to massive uh, ramifications. Uh, uh, H7N9 in, in China at the moment, cholera epidemics, of course, in Haiti and other places. MERS-CoV, we're now two and a half years into MERS-CoV transmission in the Middle East. Artemisinin resistance and, of course, Ebola. And I and look through the various ologies and the various silos in the last decade, and I actually think we have made progress. I think surveillance is much better today than it was at the time of SARS, when uh, China did... did uh, uh, ignore it, it didn't pick it up, it was either conspiracy or a cock-up or a bit of both, but the bottom line was it wasn't p picked up early enough. I think actually the epidemiology and the modelling and the public health communities, policy actually in some ways is not too bad, virology has learned to share things, and I think on the whole international cooperation has been reasonable, uh, the media have also. I think the one community that has really not stepped up to the plate has been the, my community actually, the, the patient oriented clinical research community. And I think if you look at any of these, SARS, Nipah, bird flu, enterovirus 71, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola, uh, MERS-CoV, and ask yourself what really as a clinical community did we contribute? I think it's very, very little. So if you take influenza, which is one of the few infectious diseases that could actually wipe out the whole world of the ones that we know about at the moment, and you ask yourself, do we know who to treat? Do we know with which drug or no drug? Do we know which dose to give in various, com in various uh, populations, small children, obese individuals, pregnant women, uh, old people, young people, people with renal failure? Uh, and do we know how long to give it for? Do we know whether to use a loading dose? Do we understand the pharmacology truly? Uh, do we know the role of interventions in secondary transmission? Do we know the benefits of school closure or washing hands or wearing a mask? Do we know how resistance develops and how to prevent it and how to treat it once it arrives? And do we know which combinations of antivirals and adjuvant therapies or which bundles in intensive care actually make a difference and are cost effective? I'm not sure that everybody would agree that we know the answer to many of these. That's after 20% of the world's population were infected in 2009 with the pandemic flu uh, and, and which uh, happens on an annual basis uh, with seasonal flu. So this led in 2013 to a massive review and a large number of studies, it's actually over 200 now, with recommendations that ended the overall quality of the body, the evidence was very low to low, leading to global recommendations saying, strong recommendations, very low quality evidence. Now, my mother tongue is English, 
and I would challenge anybody in this room to interpret that for me as a clinician tomorrow. What do I do as a result of that recommendation? Leading to headlines, very bold headlines in major newspapers around the world saying a very bold statement, oseltamivir does not work. I think we uh, have huge gaps in our knowledge and that's for a disease which is, which is predictable, which is annual and which we know has the potential for both epidemic and pandemics. And I think this is one of the reasons. I think we have made patient oriented research so complicated and so, in my view, over-regulated that it means that it's almost impossible to do. And the biggest problem in all of this, as well as learning how to treat patients, is that the next generation of clinical researchers would be absolutely mad to go into this specialty because they would start here with a question which they raise as a young man here with their colleagues on a ward round. They go to this desk and they write this protocol, which is now 758 pages long. It takes them about a year to write. They then have a series of interactions with a series of bodies, whether they be DSMBs or ethics committees or administrators or organizers, whatever it is, uh, through a series of video conferences, because it's always uh, multinational now. Uh, and if anybody has not seen the YouTube video on video conferencing, I please, it is the funniest thing on YouTube, I think, at the moment, and very, very true. Anyway, this young individual who's had a bright idea now goes back to his desk, and the protocol is now 898 pages. And finally, on day 611, he recruits his first patient. And that just doesn't fit into a normal career structure. You cannot say, I'll give the next 611 days. So increasingly, we're, we're outsourcing this away from, from the community into uh, companies that have drawn up. So we're moving, I think, clinicians away from doing clinical research uh, into studying ever more studies of this gene or that gene or that promoter or this promoter. And we're losing a whole cohort of people who are just not going into this. And the secondary consequences of we're not getting sufficient data of stuff that matters. So just turning to Ebola in the last few minutes, of course, is the, is the stimulus for today's discussion. But I should just remind everybody, and there's a number of people in this room that with me share the responsibility on the 10th and 11th of June 2009 in Geneva, there was a WHO technical consultation titled Research Ethics in International Epidemic Responses. It seems strangely similar to today's discussion. In fact, many of the faces look similar. And from the previous brilliant story, we learned about the responsibility. And I think we've got, we've got so far down this track now that if we don't claim this responsibility, to change for a better way the way we do this, bearing in mind that we're two and a half years into MERS-CoV and we're 18 months into Ebola, then I think we really have uh, not taken on that responsibility. So Ebola, of course, the virus, as we heard, hasn't changed today, but the ecology of the virus, the, the animal reservoir, the environment in which it exists, the society that exists in increasing urbanization has actually been what's driven this dreadful epidemic and yet we have not been quick enough to appreciate that we were still in many ways in the first six months of this epidemic and there's no blame here of who was right and who was wrong it was a collective failure uh, we treated the epidemic as we did in 1976 and i think we didn't appreciate that things have changed and things have moved on and societies have changed uh, and secondly the impact thirdly sorry the impact on the health systems uh, across the three countries, the ability to deliver a baby safely, the, deliver, the ability to deliver vaccination. We can already predict, as recently published, measles epidemic in the coming years because of a whole cohort that missed out. So it's not just the Ebola that these epidemics uh, have an impact on. It's the wider health system and, as a result, the wider society. Again, it's not just schools that have closed. We've, we've in a situation which was already tense, we've pushed aside the trust that occurs between the various elements uh, of society. And I think we, we need to appreciate not just the consequences of the dreadful number of cases and the dreadful number of deaths and the tragedy of that, but the implications for the wider uh, society. And this, I think, is part of the reason. This is the Ebola River in DRC, uh, photographed many years ago now. It's a photograph of Peter Piot. And, and if one is dealing with an epidemic in this sort of environment, uh, 
40 years ago, it's very different to dealing with an epidemic in that sort of environment. And that is the sort of environment that we're likely to see. And not only that, it may also be in the middle of a conflict or humanitarian crisis. So I think we have to shift the way we think from our traditional thinking in emerging infections. I said it today, and I, again, it's one of my sort of hobby horses. I think we allowed at various times, and, and Ross has got the history of this much better than I have, public health, the health systems, the resilience of those health systems, even the humanitarian responses, and then something I call clinical research, uh, human subject research, to become separated. We, we train our young people for tomorrow in silos where they, do, they increasingly don't understand the language between them. And unless we break down those silos, whether it be between, between public health individuals, so-called clinical medical people, so-called vets, so-called ecologists, mathematical modelers, whatever it is, that I d and people understand the anthropology and the social sciences, I don't think we're going to be able to respond either to the coming problems of a, a growing, demo changing demographic, or the problems of humanitarian responses, urbanization, or also the coming of emerging infectious diseases on top of all of those. So I think we do need a new look. We need a new paradigm, effectively. We are going to be faced with rapid emergence and spread. Globalization will push things uh, around the world very, very quickly. We've got this coming together of infections, non-communicable diseases, and a very much changing society. And across much of the world, the truth is, we have a de massive degree of inequality and mistrust between the governed and the governed, between the health systems and the patients, between public health and the communities. And this isn't just in West Africa. Recently, on a much smaller scale in the United Kingdom, there was a push to, to something called care.data, where it would be GPs would share their data with some central database. The population effectively rejected it because they didn't trust anymore the sense that that data would be used in the best way. So we have a, a trust deficit in many, many parts of the world. And I think this separation of public health and medicine is damaging. Many countries uh, function like this, and I think uh, it, it's very damaging to our ability to respond. So global health really matters, but I think it matters in a different context now. We're clearly all part of this global community. Uh, the, the world is much smaller than it used to be, and whatever happens in West Africa will have an impact here in Dublin at some point, at some stage in the future, and vice versa. This isn't just something that goes in one direction. Things will often go in others. I, after the bird flu of 2004, 2005, the world was preparing for a poultry outbreak in Asia, and it got an outbreak that was probably derived from pigs in Mexico. You, we were preparing for something, and it came in completely the other direction. Uh, we've been preparing for epidemics since 2004, 2005, and yet here we are as a community saying we haven't responded to Ebola well enough. That's a decade of preparation. This didn't come out of the blue. I think, as I commented today, the inequalities that drive migration, movement, travel, um, people wanting a better life and moving in, better, in, in different places, uh, public health and medicine, infection, non-communicable diseases. All of that sounds pessimistic. I actually think that if the world and we, and it's us, it's not some other distant body that we can blame, whether it be WHO or CDC or Public Health England or the Wellcome Trust, whoever it is, it's us that own this. It's our names on that document of five years ago, and we need to take uh, responsibility for that. And I think the, the really, really crucial issue is we have to try and reestablish trust trust between uh, professions, trust between that profession and the community and the public at large. Uh, and without that, I don't think we will see the benefits of this uh, truly potentially remarkable scientific age. Finally, I think there has to be reform of the central organizations. It doesn't really matter whether you're talking about the International Monetary Fund and its ability to respond to the financial crisis of 2008, or actually you're talking about the World Health Organization. These are organizations set up in a different era in the 1940s when the world looked very, very different. And it's no point as complaining about the WHO and saying they're not delivering because effectively we are the WHO. And if, and if we don't support the WHO, what will happen is we'll, we will move to an ever fragmented world. This is the nice view from part of Geneva and it, and it looks quite clear and when you have a single organization that is potentially in charge, if we back it sufficiently, it is clear. But it then, because we have lack of trust in it, we've then, in we then invented a whole pile of other agencies 
many of which are competing with each other and with the WHO for, for political position, for power, for money, and the rest of it. And we end up with what was a very clear picture, incredibly complicated, and worse, very fragmented, where you're lacking that ability to coordinate at a global scale where no single country, no single region dominates, but everybody is part of that. And I think we do have to get back uh, to that concept, and then we have to support it and then the WHO itself has to take that leadership position rather than a managerial position. So yes, we need better surveillance, but the truth is since 2004 and SARS, we have better surveillance. It is not perfect. There are parts of the world where it is not working as well as it should, and there still are problems with sharing of information. But surveillance is better, and I think it's going in the right direction. But I do worry when we talk about surveillance, when we don't add the response to that surveillance. We knew about Ebola in March of 2014, and we were warned by perhaps the only organization that comes out of this crisis well, and that's MSF. But collectively, and it includes myself, we did not respond for many months. So it, it is not just surveillance we need, but it's the willingness and the ability to act when we find things. And we will increasingly find things because surveillance is better. So we're now better at picking emerging infections up but we now have to act, learn to act much more effectively in a much more coordinated way, quickly and robustly. And we may sometimes get it wrong, and I think we have to have a thick enough skin that when people say you got it wrong and you overreacted, it's much better to overreact occasionally than underreact and see the consequences. So with that, and thanking the people that uh, led to many of those thoughts over the last um, 20 years or so, um, I will bring the talk to an end and I'll sing you a song. No. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that is, that's a very good question. So, very, um, so firstly, for those who don't know, Wellcome Trust, uh, independent charity, no links to any pharmaceutical sec uh, sector that, that um, has not had any links for th three decades or so, completely independent medical charity, um, approximately 20 billion pounds in assets and, and actually getting close now to a, about a billion a year to give away to people that ask us. Um, uh, so so the f one of the first things I've, I've done, which was very controversial inside and out, was actually to get rid of the um, a department and a division within our structures called International. And the reason for that was because I, th I think there is a responsibility for organizations such as ours that we don't have a siloed area within it, which is something called International. The whole organization needs to think in an international way. Uh, and that means in partnership, working with others, uh, thinking less as a little Englander, little British organization, and thinking where possible to work with others in different parts of the world uh, to achieve their and our uh, aims. So, so perhaps that's the single, there are many other changes, but perhaps uh, uh, seeing the Wellcome Trust as a global organization. Um, the Ebola crisis internally was also very important because it demonstrated that you can give out funding in, in less than a week um, compared to the normal average, which is about a year. And, and actually that, again, ha, ha, has had a profound impact um, because if we as an organization cannot take risks with what we support, then I don't know who can because whether you're the Medical Research Council in the UK or any national body funded by the taxpayers' money, you inevitably have constraints of a political cycle. So if we can't <coughs> move quickly, given the we, we, we are independent and have, do not have those constraints, then I'm not sure uh, who can. Fred. Yeah. So, uh, how do you, what 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, uh, many organizations, and this also applies to governments, um, in that slide of complicated scenario, um, I think historically have uh, been in competition as much as in cooperation, actually. And, and I think the funders uh, have to get together to work out how to not coordinate and become conservative, and that is a danger, but at least coordinate so that where there are partnerships that can be made, that, that they can be made. The other, I think, uh, you know, if you go back to 1948, of course, essentially ev everything was provided by government. That was the structure after the Second World War in essentially every country. You know, after the Second World War in the UK, the National Institute of um, Medical Research was established, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is not true in the 21st century. Governments are one player, but there are many other players. And I think uh, this dreadful term, uh, I have to say at the WHO, of non-state actors, um, which sort of implies some sort of song or, or comedy act, um, I think ha the, 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 whether it's the philanthropic sector, the civic society sector, these are part of global health now. And I think they somehow have to be represented. And I think it's much better if that is represented transparently and openly rather than influence that's neither of those two things and accountable. Whereas at the moment, because they're not really part of the conversation, a lot of that influence can cannot be transparent and open and, and I think that's that needs to change. <laughs>